the fallen state is amazing. Subscribe now. Wouldn't it be great if we could find a way to get Jesus of Nazareth to come back and run for president on the GOP ticket? Wouldn't the GOP love to get behind a guy who was a peaceful, radical, nonviolent revolutionary who hung around with lepers, hookers, and criminals, who never spoke English, was not an American citizen, a man who was anti-wealth, anti-public prayer, yes he was, Matthew 6, 5, anti-death penalty, but never once remotely anti-gay, didn't mention abortion, didn't mention premarital sex, a man who never justified torture, who never called the poor lazy, who never asked a leper for a co-pay, who never fought for tax cuts for the wealthy wealthiest Nazarenes, and was a long-haired, brown-skinned, that's in Revelations, homeless Middle Eastern Jew. Of course, that's only if you believe what's actually in the Bible. Welcome to The Fallen State. I'm Jesse Lee Peterson. My guest today has a very interesting take on Jesus and politics. I have with me John Fugel saying. You nailed it, sir. Oh, good. Well done. Uh, an actor, comedian, political commentator, and a radio talk show host on Sirius SM Radio. I appreciate you being here, man. I'm delighted to be invited, thank you. So, uh, what is a man? What is a man? Uh -huh. That's a good question, because <laughs> we live in a society right now where I think we have a lot of boys, guys, homies, players, and dudes, and bros, not a lot of men. Right. And I think a man is someone who is willing to make sacrifices for others, to have empathy for people that can never help him back. I think a man is someone who is willing to do the right thing, even if it costs him his own popularity or station. Man is someone who is um, strong in ways that go deeper than purely physical strength. So I like the great white hope. <laughs> well, the, the great male hope. The, the <laughs> you great, know who the great white hope is? Who's the great white hope? Donald Trump. Oh, yeah? The president. Maybe a great spray tanned orange hope, but uh, yeah. You don't think he's the great white hope? No, um, I'm afraid I don't. Really? Yeah, not yet. That's amazing. The, the great, but when I'm you say surprised. great white hope, what do you mean? The great hope for whites? Or just the great, the, the man who's white is who's hope for others? He, we finally have a, a man who is not afraid. If you attack, he attack back. Um, He'll even attack first sometimes. Yeah. And he uh, put the country first. Mm, we'll see, uh, won't we? And when the children of the lie call him names and things, he just tweet out, lying, cricket, Hillary, uh, whatever. He right, that, and I that, love that. I think he tends to call names first, actually. He, throws, he casts the first stone quite a bit. Well, as long as he's winning. I don't know what winning means. He's a uh, multi, he was born a millionaire. He's a very wealthy man. He's made lots and lots and lots. He made millions of dollars off his campaign. He continues to make money from our tax dollars into his personal account. So I think he's winning. But he's making America great again. We're all winning. We'll see, won't we? Yeah. Let me ask, are you a man? I aspire to be. Is that a yes or no? Uh, I consider myself a man, and I aspire to be better. And are you a beta male or an afro male? How do you define those things? The first definition you gave is the afro male. And the beta male is an emotional male who goes by what he think or feel rather than what is logical. Well, then I'd say I'm the first, but I do right respect on. men who are man enough to face and feel their emotions. But real men don't have emotions. I, we might have to dis agree to disagree on that. I think all men have emotions. Some men bury them. Some men feel them, face them. Is it something that they need to overcome? If they're bad emotions, sure. If, they're, if you're consumed by rage, greed, jealousy, hate, those are emotions you have to overcome. If you're a man who's beset by love and joy, you're doing something right. Do you, do you have anger? We all do. How about you? Sure. And when did you know that you had anger? As a teenager. Really? And what caused it? What brought it on? Many factors. Like what, for example? Cruelty of others. Uh, cruelty to me, witnessing cruelty of others causes me a lot of anger. People who have no empathy for others causes me anger. Hate, people who hate, gives me a lot of anger. 
seeing my society keep making the same mistakes and seeing a culture where big money has bought off politicians to keep us from doing the things we know work gives me anger. And then the challenge to me is, how do I repurpose that? How do I turn that anger into constructive outrage instead of destructive hate? I was going to ask, does that anger you have, uh, does it do any good? Sure. Anger? In, in what way? If your anger motivates you to fight injustice, if your anger motivates you to lift yourself up from a situation you should not be in, if your anger motivates you to get out of situations, relationships, not conducive to your wellness or betterment, then it can be a good thing. But when that anger lets you hate others, judge others, smear others, um, think you're better than other people, uh, then I think your anger is toxic. And I think hate makes us stupid. I think hate makes us sick. Do you judge? I try not to, but we all do judge. How about you? You judge at times? Well, you know how it is, right? Like other people judge. <laughs> yeah. I size people up, right? Like right. I could size someone up. I don't judge. Right. We all have our own ways of getting around that. Do you discriminate? I try not to, but I am human. And so uh, like everyone, I will have times when I judge someone before I get to know the fullness of their character and the challenge is up to me to greet people, especially those I disagree with, uh, with love, even those I'm angry towards. I've noticed that all human beings discriminate. Yeah. We can't get around it. It's we good. Can't, well, we can't get around it. We're it's good better. to discriminate. In some cases it is, yeah. and in some cases it's not. I'm sure you'd agree. I mean, we've come a long way with some kinds of discrimination in this society. Do you believe that human beings are in a fallen state? I think that it's down to the individual, and I think that you will never sink so low that you do not have a chance to redeem yourself. And what is the fallen state? I think it's different for everyone. You know, yeah. the, the ancient Jews of Jesus' day, their concept of hell was not a place of fire and brimstone. It was called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, as I'm sure you know, and that was more about separation from God. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And there are those who would say that that's when you die and don't go into the light and you stick around as a poltergeist <laughs> and a wandering angry spirit knocking things off of mantelpieces. Uh, <laughs> you know, there, there's, there's ways that you can be separated from your own love, your own potential, your own grace, and that's a prison of one's own making. And how does one overcome that fallen state? How do you come out of it? I would imagine it's a very different journey for every individual, right? Right. I mean, for some it's drugs and alcohol, for some it's anger, for some it's <laughs> But you're not really coming prison. out when you have those things. You're in the fallen state. Everyone who has anger or use drugs and alcohol to cover up the anger is in a fallen state, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, if you're not being healthy and taking care of yourself uh -huh. and being good to yourself and others, then sure, but I do think that it's a tra it, it, it can be a transient state. I'm a recovering cynic, and I don't believe any of us is beyond redemption. No, I, I agree that anyone who really wants to can be redeemed. Um, We're so agreeing we, on way too much. It's kind of exciting. I know. Were you raised by your father and mother? I was. And who were you closest to? Both of them. E equally? At different times of my life, yes. And what was it like? What is it? Your, your parents are still living? They are not. They're not living. And so what was it like being close to your father? Well, I had kind of a, I had a, ra a rather unusual childhood, sir. My, my mother was a, uh, a former nun. I heard, Catholic that. Nun. I heard about that. She was a nurse and ministered uh, as a nurse to uh, lepers. And then in a jungle hospital in Malawi, Africa, my father was a Franciscan brother. He had been trained by the brothers, uh, taught at St. Francis Prep School in Brooklyn, New York. He decided to take the vows of celibacy and poverty and obedience himself, became a brother, uh, met my mom when he had tuberculosis and she was working in Brooklyn in a hospital. Right. My mom's from the South. He fell madly in love, couldn't tell her, was not allowed. And why not? because he had promised God he never would. They had both taken vows of chastity. That's amazing. That's Catholic, man. So he, <laughs> uh, they became pen pals for many years. My mother's village in Africa did not have radios or newspapers, so my dad would write long letters about what was happening in the States with civil rights and the Vietnam War and, uh, and LBJ. He would send these letters to Africa, and my, the mother superior would um, open them first, read them, and my dad's letters sort of became the de facto newspaper for the convent in Malawi. 
Interesting. She finally left. He uh, uh, proposed to her, eventually got her to marry him. They tried to raise us to be free-thinking Catholics, and that's why I do stand-up comedy, because I can never afford the therapy I so deeply need. So you were close to your father. Yes, sir. And what was that like, being close to him, being his son? I think most men have periods in their life when they are close to their father and then not close to their father. And testosterone can make men behave in ways that they often regret later. So there were periods where I yearned for connection with him, periods where I avoided connection with him, and periods where he and I were very close. And for the last several years of his life, he and I were, uh, were deeply close. Good. And you were close to your mother, and what was that like? I mean, I think the most deep love any of us ever know is our love of our mother. Really? I think for many of us, that's the deepest love we know. And um, I was very close to her. My mother was a nurse and my father was a teacher. So I grew up watching them live their ministry. My dad felt that the same love that drew him to a life in Christian clergy also drew him to leave his order and marry this woman. And to him, it was just one long spiritual path. God wanted him to be in the clergy. God wanted him to leave and marry a woman and have kids. And uh, I was blessed at having parents who were deeply empathetic, put others above themselves, and really cared more about the teachings of Jesus than the hang-ups of dead guys and following the edicts of a pope. I noticed that men and women who are close to their fathers have peace, and men and women who are close to their mother are, mothers are unhappy. They have conflict, they're insecure, they have doubt, they're very emotional, and they don't have the peace when they're close to their mothers, but I'm when sorry they're to close hear that, to their fathers. I'm sorry to hear that because uh, my mom was awesome. Strongest person I ever knew. Oh, that's not good. Why is that not good to be a strong woman? Because a strong woman is a willful woman, and she imposes her will on you so that she can have control of you and mm. the environment around her. Well, that wasn't the kind of strength my mom had. My what mother, type did she have? Uh, my mother was incredibly supportive of my brothers and I and whatever we wanted to do. She labored long hours to provide for her family without complaining. Uh, well, she did complain. She um, was uh, independent but respectful of others. She loved my dad, but um, if he was wrong, she would tell him. And they had a very close, close friendship. I have never seen a man love a woman the way my father loved my mother, and it was a great model. I wish, uh, I, I've come to think that one of the greatest blessings of my life was having a father overwhelmingly, passionately in love with his wife, so much so that he broke a sacred vow to God for her. And your mother became an ex-nun. Did she do that because of your, your father? Yeah. She gave it up to be a wife? Uh, yes. A That's yeah. amazing. Um, are you married? I am. And how long have you been married? Uh, about a, a 13, 14 years. Really? Yes, sir. That's good. Are you a Christian? I aspire to be. Meaning what? Meaning it's easy to say you're a Christian, but I don't really often know what that term means anymore. So I aspire to live my life according to the teachings of Christ. Uh, but I would never claim to be doing it right. Because I think there's only been one true Christian, and he died on the cross. So, um, and I have not given away all my belongings to the poor, so I can't claim to truly be Christian, because Jesus said, that's how you do it. Amazing. And uh, how are you aspi aspiring to become like him? What are you doing to become like him? I try to follow the tenets of the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings in Matthew 6, 5 and the parable of the goats and the sheep. And I try to conduct myself with love, to avoid hate, to be mindful when I am uh, angry that it is not my job to judge others, it is my job to love them. And, uh, and I try to devote my energies, my talents, my platforms towards uh, helping the least among us. But if you have anger, you, you don't have love, so it's impossible to love anyone if you have anger, yeah. be, because anger is the nature of I your agree. father, the devil. And I, so how- But anger can be turned, anger can be repurposed into outrage, rather than being- But outrage is not good. Outrage only destroys you, it doesn't build you up. And it destroys other people around you, if it's your family, your, see, your children. I, we might it's have to disagree on that. I look at the Montgomery no, bus boycott and I see anger 
serving a Christian purpose there because they took the anger, purposed it into outrage, and were able to morally advance the society. But it didn't work. It didn't work. Have you noticed that black I mean, Americans it, it, are more immoral today? Not all, not all, not all, not all, but most. They are more immoral today than any other time in the history of America or mankind. I haven't met them all, so I'm not qualified. But in the case of the Montgomery bus boycott, it did work. It, it did not work. It did work. I mean, the bus, uh, it worked it as worked. far as blacks can sit. That was an example of anger turned to Anywhere outrage, turned bus. to action. Yeah. But, but prior to that anger, most black people were a noble people. I grew up in Alabama. I grew up under Jim Crow law. Mm -hmm. Loss, and I grew up on a plantation. And during those days of growing up, black Americans got married. It was unheard of to have abortions. They respected themselves and others. Whites and blacks got along. They respected one another. They didn't party together all the time, but they respected one another. And then here come the, the so-called civil rights movement, blaming white folks, causing blacks to turn away from family, starting to hate the white people. I have to break this down one point by and one then, point, because yeah. respectfully, and, I, I, I... And then uh, they started imposing themselves on white people by going into their neighborhoods, their cafes, and things like that, and you can't make anyone love you. And from then until this day, blacks have only gotten worse rather than getting better. Um, I don't know where to begin breaking that down. I, I think we're going to disagree on this point, because uh, I don't think they blamed whites. They blamed the institution of segregation which I think is an insult to God, an insult to Jesus, and an insult to the idea of America. Uh, there was never any hatred of whites in the speeches of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Right. Many, many Caucasians helped in that battle because yeah. they recognized the evil of segregation. And I don't really view going as a taxpaying American citizen, going into a white community to patronize a business as being imposing your anything on somebody. And why not? You don't have a right to impose yourself on someone else. But you have a right because to go into a business and, and, uh, and no, pay don't. money for goods and services. Only if the government, if our tax dollars are paying for it, but if you got up and you built your business in a white community or wherever, you have a right to allow whomever you want in there, and I don't have a right to be upset about that because it might not be good for your business because you're losing money, but you have the right to do that because that's your own private business, y well, and no one has a right to impose Otherwise. You have a right to try to do that. You'll be challenged because we can use the legislative branch for redressive grievances and taxpaying citizens who paid for the roads and the electrical grid that allow you to have that business uh, have a right to partake in it as well. If you wish to discriminate against a class of Americans for whatever your hang-up is, you have a right to try to do that and the citizens have a right to use the judicial branch to push back and that is what makes America great. Well, they can drive down the road past my business but if I say don't come in, they have no right to stop their car and come into my establishment. And that's what black... But why would you want to keep black people from coming into an establishment? I mean, I... Why, well, why would a Caucasian want, want to do that? I wouldn't want to do it because of my business, but I'm saying if I wanted that, I have a right to do that. And I'm not sure if it was a private wrong, club. If you have a private club, you can. Right. But not a public business when the citizens pay for that electrical grid and pay for the roads that no, lead to your business. I mean, they can go down the road, but if... Uh, if I want to do that, I can. And that's what it's, one of the ways the civil rights movement went wrong and when they tried to force white people to love them. Have I don't you think ever they tried did that. Martin, a, Martin Luther King never tried to tried force to, white people to love them. Have you ever tried to make a, a woman love you? Uh, yes, I have. And did she love you? No. It's, it doesn't work. Right, but that love, wasn't Dr. King's aim. Dr. King but, was trying to have the end of segregation and then his his mission expanded to opposing the war in Vietnam and fighting for the rights of organized labor. In this what country. he should have done is just make sure that the laws that protect white America protect blacks and then left it alone. We can agree that and, segregation's evil. And, and nice people, I mean, people would come together naturally. We, we, we can agree segregation's evil. Um, an insult to God, an insult to the teachings of Christ. segregation yeah. by the government, I would say that that's wrong. Right on. But as a human being, I have a right to decide even who I want to live in my neighborhood. Mm, I'm not sure about that. When I, I live in a pretty nice neighborhood now, and when I see people coming, looking for a place to live, I'm like looking out the window, I'm telling everybody, come and look. I'm very concerned about who's moving in my neighborhood. We, I think are we you? all are. Oh, sure. okay. But, and that's but what discrimination, you, right? 
No, it's discrimination when you try to keep someone from moving into your neighborhood because of their nationality or sexual orientation or their race or well, How about if you know that they can be pretty violent, they're going to bring crime and they're going to bring... How do you know that when other... you haven't met them yet? But we know. How do you know? We know. Uh, I don't think you no, know. No, no, we know. I don't think you know. We might not want to say, but we know. There's lots of Caucasians would look at you and think the same thing, and they'd be wrong. And they have a right to think that. They have a right to think it, you but know they don't have a right to make America that kind of playing and field. And why do they have, have the equality. right to think it? Because we have freedom of expression and freedom of thought. That's right. And because of the way blacks have acted over the last 60 years ago or so, white would be quite concerned about they're moving into the neighborhood. The hardest working people I know are black folks, so I'm not sure what you're talking Which about. Which one you know? I don't know. I haven't met them. You haven't met them? No. If every black woman in this country went on strike for a week, our economy would come to a standstill. Not true. Yes, sir. No. I think if every black woman went on a strike, most people would be happy. You know why? They won't have to hear this. They don't have to hear them complain about racism. They don't have to wait for them to get there, not on time. And then when you say, hey, I'm about to write you up, they cry racism. I think most people would be know. happy. I'd, I'd love to introduce you to some really wonderful black women sometimes. There are some good ones out there. There's millions of good ones out there, sir. Really? Millions of good white folks, Latinos, there's, there's good people everywhere. I said there are some good ones. And, and the real, the, 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 the demons are not in groups, it's the demons within ourselves. It's, you, the, it's the personal failings we have to struggle with and we are called upon, if we take Jesus' teaching seriously, to not hate these people but to love them and help them uplift. And I think that's what you do. Right, but don't accept their wrongdoing. You have to correct them. If you truly love them, you will have to correct them. Right, but I think but don't keeping make someone feel... from moving into a neighborhood isn't correcting it. It's discriminating against them, and it's making and them okay. hate you back. It's okay. It's not okay in America. It's okay in some countries, but America has, has kind of worked that out in the legislative process. <laughs> well, you, you can't. I mean, you really I've can't. I've got to ask you this. I've got to ask. Do you think black Americans are suffering due to the lack of, I mean, due to racism? or the, like, the destruction of the family and the lack of moral character? When, well, I think what you call the destruction of the family is a symptom of a greater problem. What's I that? think it's a symptom, not the problem itself. What's the problem? Uh, well, I think we're still living with the after effects of slavery and Jim Crow, and, people, and we still have an economic racism. When I say racism, I'm not talking about bigotry. I'm not talking racial hate. I'm talking institutionalized bigotry that, that tells black folks and low-income Latinos and low-income whites you work hard, you play by the rules, you can rise in society. That's the American dream we were all taught. Right. You know as well as I do, that's not the real playing field. Right. You can work hard your whole life and follow all the rules and get nowhere. And when poor communities are deliberately underfunded, when you see sentencing guidelines designed to make blacks serve more crime, and when you see a $75 billion a year mass incarceration system where you have more black men employed by corporations behind bars and outside of bars, first time drug offenders get sent into jail, where we, the taxpayer, pay for their three square healthcare room and board, and a corporation pays them 16 cents an hour to work, that's the child of Jim Crow. The drug war was created, and we know this. Why Nixon's aides have said they did this to keep blacks down. And on top of it, look at the poor neighborhoods and the public schools they have there versus the white neighborhoods. Poor communities are deliberately underfunded, and we have kept this system in place. It's very, very hard for poor white folks are to climb that economic 100 ladder. Are you 100% sure that that's the problem for black folks. That's why black people are in such a mess. Oh, listen, I think sure? what you talk about without a wedlock birth and what have you, I think that's the symptom of a greater problem when people have given up hope. People look at what the playing field is. They see in poor communities, that guy's not a doctor, that guy's not a, a surgeon, that guy's a pimp, that guy's a thief, that's what I've got to do. You don't believe that America can get better. You don't believe your life can get better. You have no hope. There are no businesses Who's opening up. Who's to blame up. for that? The pimps and, and the hoes and the, and the hood. Well, uh, society in general, but let's go for all the corporations that outsourced American it's manufacturing jobs. It's amazing that you someone else Hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you're, you're, we're all responsible for our own actions. Right. But society is responsible for people giving up hope. Amazing. So let me ask, if that's true, and well, not just black folks. I'm talking right. low-income people, low-income whites, rural whites. I mean, you know, I've spent a lot of time with people who just don't believe it. And then you have drugs or alcohol that make you feel good. And there's pleasure and there's happiness, right? Drugs and alcohol will give you pleasure. Right. They, will give, they won't give you happiness. Right. They won't, but, but they won't but, give you peace. They won't give you peace. But they will give you happiness. But I used to smoke marijuana. Have you ever smoked pot? Have I ever? Uh -huh. Yes, sir. I felt so happy when I smoked the pot. But I had no If you peace. have good stuff, yeah. <laughs>
So, <laughs> you buy from the right guy, I guess. So let me ask this. Um, if what you just said is true about the situation of black people, why it wasn't like that when I was growing up. When I was growing up, blacks got married. Yeah. They, it was an embarrassment to have children out of wedlock. They worked hard. They I, know bought, lots, I know lots of married bought, black folks, sir. I know they, lots of married black folks. They bought land. Mm -hmm. uh, they, I went to an all black school. They got a good education. They went to black university. They came yeah. back as professionals. And here's the law, the Jim Crow laws were against them. Mm -hmm. But they did much better under that law than they did now that they have freedom. So if what you said is the cause of the problems in the black community, why didn't we see it more then than we, than we do now? Well, since and, and blacks were not going to jail. I don't know anyone who went to jail or even went to a jail. Right, but that's pre-drug war. That's pre-drug war. No, that's pre-famine destruction and right, turning but, their lives over to the democratic government. And, we've always had a democratic and, government. I mean, the Democrats who were encouraged them under Lyndon B. Johnson, get the man out of the home, the government would become the daddy, That's and not the, what corrupt, li the corrupt so-called so civil rights leaders like Jackson and others would think for you and no do one it ever for said you. That, sir. But that's what happened when the civil rights movement happened. That's, that's and not they started what downhill. So why was nobody it, ever said those things. Why was it better for blacks? I haven't. See, I'm uh, surprised you would say this because I, I consider that bearing false witness. No, one no, ever said no. Those no. I'm a witness to it. I lived through it. When did Lyndon Johnson say those things? Back those in aren't 60 quotes. years ago or so. Those aren't quotes. You're putting words in the well, dead man's mouth. Lyndon Johnson said, was a racist, right? but he was also a hero of he civil didn't rights. He didn't say it exactly like that, but when he brought in welfare and said, you cannot have a man in the home. That's not what he said, yes, sir. Yes, he did. No, you, sir, he did not look, say that. I lived through it. He, I have family Lyndon members. Johnson who did never it. said you can't have a man yes, in the did. home. You sir. could not get a welfare check if you were married. That's that's not true either. It is true. We know so there it's are so many married true. people who are on welfare and who are on uh, but SNAP the assistance. If they were, the government didn't know it. But let's look at the 1950s. Under Eisenhower, the last Republican president to ever balance a budget, hasn't happened in 70 years. They talk a good game. Last Republican president to ever balance a budget. You had a lot of capitalism. You had a lot of what is called socialism. You had the GI Bill. You had the interstate highway plan. You had progressive taxation. You had a Republican Party that cared about unions. And whether you like labor unions or not, they have always been the strongest voice working Americans have ever had. Once they began breaking unions and exporting our jobs overseas due to outsourcing, automation, well, the government factories is not closed. Do for you. We knew that at but one factory, time. No, I'm talking the private sector, but sir. Listen, it was no, no, excuse me, may I finish? It factories was have shut down. It was that helped to free black America. Once so upon a time it was, it was blacks, sir. And Repub uh, blacks and white who founded the Republican Party because the Democrats didn't want blacks free. That's very they true. They fought against it. That's very but true. Gotta, the Republican I, Party used to be much more liberal. But what I'm saying is, as you outsource the jobs and have automation and deindustrialization, you don't have the American dream anymore because you can't go in Detroit well, and work true. on the line to build your family's well, way to the middle class. Well, the great white hope is taking care of that. We'll get back to him. He's bringing all that back. We'll uh. get back to him. <laughs> We in New but York, we, sir, we in New York have me. known this guy for 30 years, and right. I'm afraid we know better. There's a reason he lost his own district in the Republican primary. Because those, those folks in New York are, li are liberals. Would you pay, sir, to attend Trump University? Would you pay Donald Trump money to take his online college? If I wanted to go to school and it was a good school, do you yes, know I would Trump? Pay. Do you know how I much know money? I know about that situation, but I want to come back to that. Do you know the that. cash amount Donald Trump has had to pay for defrauding people with Hold an online scam university? Do you Hold know the thought. cash amount he had to pay? If you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. Okay, that's a pivot, sir. If I'm you asking like you. If you like your health care, you can keep your health care. And do you know what that was about? Uh huh. You know well, what that was about? That. That's about the insurance companies hold ripping that off people. I not like about my Obama. doctor, and I lost my doctor. Did you well, lose your doctor? Hold that thought. Why? Did you have a junk plan that, that was invalidated under the ACA? Did you have a junk plan that was invalidated under the ACA? I could not afford my doctor anymore. Well, I'll but remind you, I if I may, sir, uh, the Affordable Care Act was started. The whole notion <laughs> of the mandate, that's a Republican plan. Liberals wanted single payer. Are Democrats wanted a public option. I aspire to be liberal. You do? Jesus, sir, was liberal no, and I aspire wasn't. to be liberal. I, I want to get to Jesus. I saw on a video what I you said you about Jesus. Yeah. And I want to come back to that. Okay. But I want you to tell me. But again, me, Donald Trump, do you know the cash amount he had to pay to come back to for the ripping off Americans with a fake college? Does anyone know in the room? We're going to come back. $25 million. Hey, we'll come back to that. And now, a word from our sponsor. Hello, everybody. Troll your liberal family members by getting them our brand new Fallen State t-shirts. On the front, it says, The Fallen State. 
On the back it says, that's amazing. And don't forget our coffee mugs. The front, the fall estate, the back, did you have fun? And don't forget my book, The Antidote, Healing America from the Poison of Hate, Blame, and Victimhood. You can out of here. You can go to the Fall Estate TV and order now. I want you to tell me if what you believe about blacks and why they're in the condition that they're in is real. You're asking a white comedian? Why, why, it, why wasn't it like that when I was growing up? When were you growing up? So the 50s, the 60s, the 70s? Yes, well, yes. Okay. Well, mm -hmm. uh, again, that was before the decline of the U.S. middle class, before the decline of labor unions and the outsourcing of jobs, and before the late 70s, early 80s redistribution of wealth to the upper 1%. Did it have anything Since to do Reaganomics, with the Since Reaganomics, it's been making the rich richer and the poor poorer, and you can trace all of this to the, the beginning of the breaking of unions and Reaganomics redistributing wealth to the wealthiest of Amazing. us. Amazing. Did it have anything to do with the, the destruction of the black family? I think what you're talking about is a symptom of a problem, not the problem, and I know lots of black folks who are happily married and raising their kids. But did it have anything to do with the destruction of the black family? I think the drug war had a lot to do with the destruction of the black family, and I think getting rid of the American middle class had a lot to do with what you call the destruction of the black family. I know lots of black families that don't consider themselves destroyed. Do, so you're not answering my question. Um, I need a yes or no on it. I'm black and a little slow. Does it, did it have anything to do, the condition of black folks today, not all, not all, but most, does it have anything to do with the destruction of the black family? I reject the question. You I don't. Reject it? I know black families that aren't destroyed. I think what there you're talking some about that are not. is you're poverty. Right. What you're talking about are symptoms of poverty, symptoms of hopelessness, no. cultural hopelessness. Why should a young 13-year-old no, no. girl believe that John, there's any life for her, and then some smooth-talking guy comes John, over and tells her she's beautiful? You're too nice of a guy to believe that. You want me to believe that people are bad? Let me tell you this. You want me to believe people are bad, and I won't do it. John, I love people. I love poor people. But John, you're not paying attention. Excuse when me? we had family, we didn't have that. When blacks had morals and values and they respected their neighbors and they treated people the way they like to be treated, you didn't have black men going to jail. 77% of black babies born out of wet law. Mm. You didn't have abortion. Uh, you didn't have a drug uh, war either. You didn't have a drug war that singles out those. black and brown men for nonviolent drug you didn't offenses. Have what? You didn't have a drug war that funds a private prison industry, you know seventy-five billion dollars a year, and Nixon's own people admitted it was about locking why up black and brown men. That? Why didn't they have that back then? Why didn't they have a drug war? The yeah. drug war? Then it's the whole drug thing. Because why didn't they have it back then? Well, it, I mean, you want to go to the whole history of the drug no, war in this country? It began answer. with racism against the Chinese in the oh, eighteen seventies. I mean, yeah, they did not have it because they had family, they respected their father and mother, they respected their grandparents. But I think we're talking about the same thing. And they were thing. not unhappy, so they didn't need the drug. Right, but what I'm saying is as the middle class has disappeared and the poor have gotten poorer and the squeeze has been on, people have lost hope. And you know, sir, oh, let me tell there you are so many Caucasians who, who have children out of wedlock, so many Caucasians well, who are low don't income. Need a new way. How many rich and middle class? Seventy-seven percent. How many rich and middle class black families do you know that have those problems? This is a poverty situation. More have it than not. But let me ask. Are you okay? I, I'll introduce you to some black families. You said because they were poor. I grew up in a, a tin roof house, and it was made out of wood. And, and at night, if you're driving down the road, and we had the lights on, you could see all the way through what did the your house. Father, what did your father do, sir? My father. Uh, he, he worked at a steel mill. Once he left Alabama, he moved to Indiana. Union, union labor. Yeah, he worked for union labor. steel. Union labor. I don't know what that means, but he worked at a steel mill. Meaning that, that it had a union? It means he had a pension. It means he had health benefits. It means he had a pathway but to the middle class. But prior to that, he worked a plantation until he grew up, became an adult, and went there. But That's my, the American dream, right? You said it's because of being poor. We had a... a uh, it's because of no hope, My sir. house had 10 it's rooms on no it. hope. We had two bedrooms. No, we had a living room with two beds, one bedroom, and a kitchen. We had a fireplace. The bathroom was outside. We had to go out. Have you ever gone outside to use the toilet? Yes. It was fun, huh? No. Oh. Um, we, uh, and yet, because of those values, we believed in God. We didn't hate one another and others. We were not 
Andras and, and, was this and Robin during, was White this during people. segregation, sir? And was this a, during segregation? Yes. Then I would I would disagree and say that we didn't love one another. Well, we did. Well, it we, was when white people that are not letting that. when white people are not letting black people use the same bathrooms, not sit at the same but counters, it wasn't that's the not white love. People, it was the law. I got to move on to Jesus, please. So you My believe favorite in Jesus, sure? And who is Jesus to you? Jesus is. Um, well, there are many different Jesuses. There is, you can believe Jesus is the literal Son of God. You no, I'm talking about how you, pers who is he to you personally? Oh, I see. I will say that he is my teacher, he is my brother, he is my hero. He is my inspiration. He is my guiding light. He is the embodiment of God's love in human form. And you said that Jesus were, uh, was anti-capitalism. Do you believe that, or was that a joke? That's what I, when I saw you saying it, I, I saw Well, he was anti-wealth, sir. He was anti-wealth. Uh, capitalism didn't exist back then, so it's a bit of a joke, but he was decidedly anti-wealth, yes. Really? Yes. And what is it about him that made you believe that? When he said it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter heaven, or the only way to be perfect and follow me is to give all your belongings and possessions away to the poor. No, that meant that you could be as wealthy as you want, but don't put don't put that before him. Okay, that's not what he don't said. Don't be don't let it be. Remember that's the some prosperity gospel. Remember stuff. the young, the rich young ruler, he was like Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. How can I follow you? That's the guy I'm talking about. And Jesus said, Okay, you can follow me by giving up all your own, because he his heart was in his money, yes, in his things, right? Yeah. And Jesus said, Okay, you can give that up. You can follow me if you give that up. And That's what said, all of his disciples he did. He said, no, I don't think I can do right, that. But the, but the 12 but apostles heart, did it. The 12 the, apostles gave it all but, up and followed Right, him. because their hearts were with him yeah. and not in material wealth. Yeah. It didn't mean you cannot have. He didn't support material wealth. Okay, well, uh, I'm not anti-capitalist. I'm a capitalist, but, but I'm Jesus a capitalist. Jesus wasn't either. That's well, the point. It, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to because enter the kingdom of Because of the ego, because of the fallen state. Um, you said that... Uh, so. Was Jesus uh, anti-poor? He was the opposite he, of that, sir. Yeah. Uh, he said that if you don't work, you don't eat. He did not say that, sir. He did say that. He never said that, he sir. He said that. No, sir, he did if not say that. If you don't no, work, you don't eat. That. What did he say about that? You are misquoting Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. What did he say about that? He didn't say it. You're, you're quoting Paul. What did he say about it? That's Paul. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, was Paul not Jesus. inspired by him? Uh, he says he was, but you Paul, didn't, Paul did not say if you don't work, you don't eat. Do you want you me to tell you what Paul said? What did he say? He was talking about the Thessalonians who believed the end was coming and it stopped working. And he was saying, you, in the past tense to the Thessalonians, did not pay the ones, did not give food to the ones who didn't work. And many of them had stopped work because they thought the kingdom of God was at hand. It's often misquoted, Jesus didn't say it. It's Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. So let me let me ask. So you, do, you do you believe? Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Jesus didn't I hear say what it. You said, I'm gonna come back to it in a minute. Okay. But do you believe Paul was inspired by God? I don't know. Paul writes very movingly in many ways about. Uh, love and the virtues of love, and Paul uh, was pretty misogynist and really hated women. Um, <laughs> he was. He what? was. And Paul, Paul had some real hang-ups. Because yeah. Paul, Paul had Do a lot of hang-ups. Do your parents know you think this way? Yes, sir. They're, my parents are no longer with us, but they did know I thought this <laughs> way. You, and my were parents you, were not Paulists, they were Christians. Were you thinking this way prior to their death? Yes, sir. And they knew it? My parents were pleased at my scholarship of Scripture and that I knew what I was talking about. Really? Indeed. Were you an only child? I was not. Oh. <laughs> I have two younger brothers. You say Jesus was, was anti-death penalty? Completely, sir. And why do you say that? Do you want me to run through all the verses? No, just because of time. Just give me one example of him. He, um, well, he, okay, let's say he wasn't anti-death penalty. He's, he just thought only people who have never sinned should be allowed to carry them out. Would you agree? Let he without sin throw the first stone? Yes, sir. So you're saying he was for but if you were a sinner, you didn't have a right to stone someone Well, else. he also you said... You might have a point there. I don't know. How do you, how do you read, I've never heard forgive us our one. trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us? Right. How do you read, if someone hits but you, turn the other cheek? How do you read, forgive those who wrong you 70 oh, times 7? Let me, let me tell you how. Good question. He meant, if someone hit you, don't hate them because you become like what you hate. So don't hate. You right. can defend yourself, 
but don't be angry. Yeah, but you know, he was that's not, all he meant by not big it. on he killing the sinner. He doesn't stand there and let someone beat you up. And, and I'll, I'll also yourself. remind you in the book of Genesis, God puts a mark on Cain after he kills his brother to protect him, the first ever murderer, and God gave him a pardon. Because God forgives. Right on. But let me ask you this, and I want to get into all that, but I don't have time. I got my little sign. We don't right have on. my sign. You say that Jesus was never... You also anti -gay. said gay. Jesus was, was never anti gay. Never. And where's your proof of that? Where's your proof he was? No, no, no. I have my proof. I want to hear it because I'm watching this video. I'm like, wow, this nice guy said it, but I didn't know if it was a joke or not. I'm wondering if your... you're going to use uh, Matthew 19 to say he was anti gay, uh, but he was never once anti gay. What did Matthew 19 say? That's where he says uh, uh, male and female he made them when uh -huh. he's giving the rules for marriage. Right. Um, but he also says in Matthew 19 that. Uh, there's three types of people who won't be getting married. He uses the umbrella term eunuch. But we those don't who were born do eunuchs, also, those who become... deal with the gay stuff. Right, well, I'm getting to that. He, he says, wasn't for that. Those who were born eunuchs, those who were made eunuchs by men, and those who make themselves eunuchs for the greater glory of God, meaning those born not into marrying women, those castrated, so they're not going to marry women, and those who become celibate religious, so they're not going to marry women. But where was he... Matthew 19. Was he for... Homosexuality? He never condemned it, and he never uh, said it was fabulous. When he said that he, he abhorred homosexuality, he did not abhor homosexuality. What did what did he mean by that? He never said that. When he said it, what did he mean by he that? He never says that in the gospel, sir. What does he say about that? What does what, what are you saying? Said when did Jesus he say he abhorred homosexuality? It's not in the gospels. Amazing. Um, no, it, it's not in the gospel, sir. He never said it. Do you believe that Jesus support uh, premarital sex? He never condemns it outright. You say he's for that? Uh, he never condemns it outright. I think he's for treating women and yourself with respect. So because you don't believe he's spoken against it, are you saying you believe he was okay with it? I'm saying if Christians devote a lot of attention to criticizing and smearing something that Jesus never mentioned, I don't see how they can call the action Christian. So do you believe that because he didn't mention it, that meant he was for that? Nope. I'm just saying he never condemned it, so I don't see why Christians do. Would you have sex out of wedlock? Would I have sex out of wedlock? It depends on how drunk you get me. <laughs> what do you have in mind, sir? If you're not drunk, would you do it? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm in wedlock right now, but if I wanted to and it was consensual, yes. I would not have a problem with that. And uh, You would not have a problem with it? With sex out of marriage? Right. Sex out of marriage? Right. You got a funny way of being a Trump supporter. What do you mean? Would you condemn Donald Trump for sex out of marriage? Sex out of marriage is wrong. So it would you condemn happen. Donald Trump for doing I it? I wouldn't condemn him, but I would not agree with him. Okay. So I don't think you should cheat on your wife you or were, your husband. I don't you, think people should, should no, no, cheat. That's on not what I asked. If you, I'm involved, agreeing with you about Trump. No. I'm, do you believe that? It's okay to have sex out of wedlock. It's really interesting that you find that a problem and yet you support Donald Trump. You're not answering the question. Uh, would I be okay with people having sex out of wedlock? As yeah. long as no one's being hurt or exploited, it's none of my business. And so if you are not drunk or high, would you have sex out of wedlock? Um, uh, if I liked the person and they liked me and it was consensual and uh, no one was being hurt or exploited, then yes. Consenting are you okay with having, making babies out of wedlock? Do you think people should be incarcerated for it? No, you're, you're not supposed to answer a question with a question. Am I okay with it? I think it's better for a child to grow up in a home with loving parents, but we live in a free society and we haven't legislated that. Really? And so how about self-control? Should we have self-control so yes. that we don't do that? We should have self-control so we don't do a lot of things that how about us. How about making a baby out of wedlock? I I am not uh, eminent enough to condemn people who do it. I do find it strange when people who condemn abortion also condemn having the baby. Is it right to have babies out of wedlock? Is it right to have babies out of wedlock? Yes. I, it's not, I, I don't have any qualification to pass judgment on that, sir. Do you know right from wrong? I, I think we all do, yes, no, and I you? don't get to judge people who have babies out of wedlock. How about you? You know right from wrong? I like to think I do, yes. So is it right to have babies out of wedlock? It's not right to judge people who do it. That's not what I'm asking. I don't get it, to, I'm not I'm asking, not gonna judge right someone. To judge I'm not going to judge know. someone who has I'm a baby out of wedlock. Personal opinion. If a woman's pregnant and the guy takes off, what should she do, sir? Terminate it or have it? What I'm, would you have a woman do? I'm asking do? your personal opinion. Is it right 
to make babies out of... I think you're of- looking for a, uh, uh, respectfully, I think you're looking for a uh, virtuous argument for a mean judgment. I, I, you're my guest and you're so smart. I watch your videos. I want to know... I'm happy to meet you too. Yeah, me too. You're very nice. I am. Well, I'm not nice. Well, me- you've been nice to me. Oh, uh, yeah. But is it right to have babies out of wedlock? It's not right to judge people who do. I didn't ask about judging people. Well, I don't get to say that. I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the eminence to condemn people. Would you people. make a baby out of wedlock? Uh, would I? Yes. I'm married. I've made a if baby within wedlock. If you were not married, would you make one out if of wedlock? If I wanted to, I would. I live in a free society. And would you? If I wanted to, I would. Why, would you do it, though? If I wanted to, I would. You said Jesus was uh, a long-haired, that part, Brown that part, skin. I can't, I can't confirm the long hair. That one I'll grant you. He's long-haired in paintings and like your cameraman over here. But uh, <laughs> there is no actual biblical uh, uh, explanation of Jesus having long hair. And so you said Jesus had long hair, mm-hmm. brown skin. According to Revelation, he had brown uh, skin. Homeless. Yes. Middle Eastern Jew. Indeed. And where you get that image from? Well, he lived in the Middle East. He was Jewish, and he didn't have a home. He left and went on a ministry. And he and his apostles were subject to the kindness and generosity of those who hosted them. How do you know that he was uh, brown skinned? In the book of Revelation. It said he was brown skinned? It says his feet were the color of burned brass. His hair was like wool. He could have had a good tan. Have Again, you, have that's you gone book of to Revelation. the beach? That's the book of Revelation. You should see my Jesus over there when he goes to the beach. I've been to the beach. My he hair doesn't look like I've that. been to the beach. My hair never became like wool. Uh, a lot of black people think, oh, I'm so out of time. A lot of black people think he looked like black Americans. Uh, I think he overseas. looked like a Middle Eastern man. I don't think he was white or black. I think he looked like a Middle Eastern Jew of the first century. Oh, okay. Go to Israel uh, and see how they look. If Jesus walked the earth today, would he be a social justice warrior? Indeed. And, why and he'd he? be crucified too. Really? Yeah. And I think if Jesus walked the earth today, he would be fighting for the least of us because that's what he did and that was his consistent message through the Beatitudes and through Matthew 25. Do you agree with uh, abortion? Do I agree with it? Yeah. I don't want to incarcerate women who do it. But you're not answering my question. Do you personally, are you personally okay with women having abortions? See, that's, it's, a, it's a weird question because I don't think I have the right or anyone with a penis has a right to tell a woman what to do. The Bible is not anti-abortion. And if you look at the book of Numbers, God gives Moses very specific and gruesome abortion tips for wives who are pregnant by other men. Do you personally disagree with abortion? Um, I personally disagree with incarcerating women for doing it. One last time. Do you personally disagree with abortion? I am not morally qualified to condemn someone who has to make that choice, and I don't think men have the right. You mentioned men and penis. So if you they go make, together. If you make a baby, and this woman you make this baby with decided, for whatever reason, I'm not going to have this baby, I'm going to kill it. You don't have any say-so about that? I think a man does have say-so, and a man has a right to sue that woman, and uh, a man has a right to sue for redress of grievances, yeah. So a man with a penis should say something about it, have an opinion of abortion, right? Ultimately, it rests with the woman, but a man has a right to try to make her carry the baby to term. I don't think he should, but he has the right. Uh, women who are killing children within their womb, they're lost mentally and emotionally. That's an opinion. They would appreciate a wise man telling them and waking them up and informing yeah, them. Yeah, they'd appreciate a job to, and a living wage and a man as, who doesn't run away. They'd appreciate what, a husband who stands by their side. As to what they're doing is being wrong, that they're wrong for what they're doing, that's another way. And so men should be involved in it because these women are clearly lost. I respect any woman's choice because I don't get to judge it and I don't believe the Bible can be used against abortion. If you believe in the great flood, God drowned every pregnant woman and her fetus on the same day. Define judgment for me. You, you use that word a lot when you say we don't have a right to judge. To condemn others. Define judge. To condemn others. And in, so, the, case of, in so, the case of abortion, here's my deal. Uh, it's always been around. It'll always be around. And we don't have an abortion problem in this country. We have an unwanted pregnancy problem and an abortion symptom. It wouldn't be around if men were men. I agree with you on that completely. But both political parties make a lot of money off abortion and make a lot of votes off abortion. Both political parties. So it's not going to change. They're going to keep us fighting our entire life. And our grandkids will be fighting over this too. They're not to blame for individuals having abortion because you're responsible for your own But it's not going to solve. Right, but what I'm saying is our grandkids will be fighting over this too. It's never going away. It's a racket both parties use to raise money and votes. It will go away once men 
return to their natural state of being. I would love to see abortions end because yeah. every child brought into this world is wanted and loved. That is my dream, and I'm sure we share that dream. Uh, again, I think we have an unwanted pregnancy problem, and I would love to see all the conservatives and progressives get together and say, what can we do as a culture about to reduce women, unwanted pregnancies? Because you ban abortion, you're going to see a million new Dr. Kermit Gosnell butcher clinics open I know, up. No, what a terrible man. But, what, but there's going to be more of that if you overturn Roe v. Wade. But it's easier than that. All we have to do is get those women who believe in abortions and who hate men to return to God. If they develop, hated men, they wouldn't be needing abortion. Develop a, a sense of character. If they hated then, men, they wouldn't be pregnant. Once they become more women, they wouldn't have to have abortion. Yeah, I know lots of women who've terminated pregnancies and they're very moral. No. Yes, sir? No. I'll introduce I you. I guarantee you don't. I can guarantee you I yes. I guarantee you don't. I can guarantee you yes, and I don't get to judge them either. Two, give me a short answer. Uh, two black guys went into a Starbucks in Philadelphia, sat there looking silly. They looking asked silly, them to, sir? Really? Yeah, they asked them to leave. They gave the manager a hard time. They did white, not. A, a, they were waiting a, for no, a white no, no. friend. No. They were waiting Let for a white friend. No, no, no. They gave the manager a hard time. They wouldn't leave. And even if they were waiting for they, a they friend. They were not asked to leave. And sir. someone asked them. Yes, they were. They were not asked to leave. They yes. asked to use the restroom, and they were told you have to buy something first, the police, and they were waiting for their friend. The black police commissioner of Philadelphia said that those guys was wrong. Which they, guys were they, wrong? The uh, black guys. That the okay, cops Starbucks didn't do fired the, the manager. I know, they threw them under the bus. Well, you because know what? Those weak. men didn't break the law. They're weak. Mm, they're good. They're smart business So what's the black Starbucks, as smart capitalists, don't need a boycott. Was the black commissioner lying when he's police commissioner lying when he said they were at fault, the black guys? I would have to see the exact quote the commissioner said. Yeah, take said. a look at it. And then he came back because somebody got to him. Those men were like, not oh, breaking sorry, the law. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said Those that. Those men were not Racism. breaking the law, and they were not bothering anyone, and they committed zero crimes, and they had handcuffs put on them. My final question. Did you have fun? With you, absolutely. I come back. I'm Thank not going to read the comment section on this one. <laughs>